Hello and welcome to this video on a disingenuous and unconscionable trend in academia called predator publishers. In recent years, academia has been the centre to a series of scandals, whether this was the recent Circle pranks, get me off your insert obscenity mailing list, and more. These publishers, if you wish to call them that, are such a problem that there exist substantial databases and lists. One of the better known is Beale's List. This process is the new directory listing or registry scan. Let's begin with what the problem is and why. Predator journals, and on a larger scale, Predator publishers, claim to be peer-reviewed academic journals, but they rarely have the rigour and process that they claim to. List of failings include a generic name, or one that closely emulates prestigious journal, a very wide scope of content, whereas most authentic journals tend to be very narrow and specific, missing any kind of editor, proofreading and typesetting, a lack of peer review despite claims otherwise, and a ridiculous turnaround time for publication. Some claim as little as 72 hours. Often a substantial fee but this is still well below an authentic journal. Most, if not all, are exclusively digital. The worst have terrible web pages full of errors. The claimed editors are often ignorant of their role and often unverified. A false or misleading impact factor measurement? They solicit content via random and unending torrents of emails. They fail to give copyright information. And finally, either there is no or a very limited retraction policy in effect. These 12 points may not all be present, but a substantial number can immediately indicate a predator journal. These also highlight the worst failures. As was explained in the What is Peer Review video, there is a process in place to keep the integrity of published research intact. The problems just described undercut that process if for no other reason than a lack of actual peer review. The problems of predator journals are exemplified by the following effects. The lack of editors, proofing, or peer review leads to the publication of false data, poor methodologies, and in some cases repeated, or worse yet, duplicitous images and results, as exemplified by the International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology and the debacle that ensued. This allows false results and conclusions to be published and enter the academic record. In an authentic journal, an expert would have an opportunity to spot the methodological flaws, unsubstantiated, or untenable content and conclusions. In some cases, they even spot altered images. The latter is regularly observed by other members of the scientific community, but the peer review process substantially curtails the number. It is not perfect, as demonstrated by the Wakefield disaster, but to borrow a paraphrase quote from Churchill, it is not a good system, but it is the best of the worst. The lack of peer review has a secondary effect that is less substantive. It reduces the quality of published research in predator journals. A willingness to publish any received manuscript with minimal review has led to considerable embarrassment in the past, as these groups will be more than happy to put content online so long as it is paid for. Notionally, through peer review, weaknesses or flaws can be corrected and trolls can be mitigated. If this had been followed, the Journal of Advanced Computer Technologies would not have received the embarrassment it did. This problem is especially pronounced with methodologies. Without peer review, appropriate methods, results, and more importantly conclusions cannot be vetted. Is the sample size adequate? Has the model been verified? Or is it flawed, such as the Seralini study? The comparatively low cost to publish in these journals is a strong draw card for researchers who are already operating under considerable financial restrictions. More so for junior academic staff. Where a quality journal will cost between $1,000 and $4,000 to publish in, a predator may offer their services for as little as $150 an article. This is still an excessive cost for the services rendered, 
However, in context it is a bargain. This is also a significant reason for digital-only formats. These online-only services often claim that it is to enable faster turnaround times at lower cost. Unfortunately, it also allows these services to complete a copy-and-paste publication without peer review, typesetting, or other editorial work that should be possible and should be conducted. These online-only journals can also claim a physical location that has no relationship to their actual place of business. This is all the easier as communication is via email, Skype, or other digital formats. There is no traceable hard copy, and often these are not looked for. These companies will also often claim an American, European, or other similarly developed and reputable country and location for further credibility. Reality is often very different, where you will find that they are based in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, or East Asia. You might be forgiven for not realising this, but the websites for these predators will often be full of errors in spelling, grammar, or syntax. As unpleasant as the prospect is, these predator journals are often based in developing countries with a growing class of educated individuals who are more often than not the victims of this scam. These people who recognise the purpose, place and process for academic publishing, they know the problems with research, they also recognise the way it can be defrauded and abused. This extends to the editorial boards of these journals. Some of these editors may even be surprised to find themselves members. It is a regular problem with predator journals who claim to have substantive figures from their field on board. These people have their name, picture, and other details prominently displayed. This is meant to add credence to the service. Even in cases where the predator has received the voluntary expertise of an editor, that expert may not see a manuscript during their tenure there. That assumes their tenure ever ends. This again is using an appearance of due process, a veneer of peer review that once you scratch below the surface, it very quickly disappears. Finally, there is a lack of clarity in copyright and retraction policies, which undermine the process. Copyright is a significant issue when it comes to publishing an academic paper. Copyright is how publishing companies make their money. This restricts the paper's dissemination. It means they can control who accesses it for a cost. It also prevents authors from going from journal to journal trying to get their article published. While that happens, they may go to another publishing company and repeat this process. This leads to the same article being published more than once. This can be done many times with low cost of predator publishers. Their apparent authenticity leads to the paper receiving a form of legitimacy. Even if the first journal retracts the paper, the fact it remains in circulation in other journals is a problem. This is why a retraction policy is important and the copyright notice is important. It prevents an author from publishing, retracting, and republishing, or in a worst-case scenario, leaving a retracted paper in circulation in other journals. Even in cases where the article is rewritten, but the results are republished, this is sometimes called redundant publication. In a normal, authentic journal, the process of retraction is predictable and based on specific acts, omissions, or failures. For example, the misrepresentation of results, or in extreme cases, fraud in the results presented. In other cases, an undeclared conflict of interest could be a cause for retraction. And these are reported to the lead author, who is given an opportunity to correct their work, or to defend themselves from their detractors. After a time, this is escalated to the journal, and the editor evaluates the observed problem. They then contact the lead author, and they again are encouraged to correct any problems. If this fails, the editors then have an opportunity to correct the published article via editorial notes, a preface, inviting a contrary submission, and if need be, retraction. This keeps retracted or subpar work out of the academic record, which is an important part of the quality control process. These predator journals simply take money, put whatever they have been given online, and then fail in this final hurdle. You might think that with all of this identifying a predator, 
it should be easy. Unfortunately it is, and it isn't. Some of these Predator publishers make an effort to create a perception of validity. They claim to have conferences, involvement with clinical trials, and all manner of other conventional trappings. Enough researchers fall for this that they grow. Unfortunately, this growth is only in volume of Predator Journal content, not quality, which creates Predator publishers. On the other hand, an academic may be confused or may be misled by a very new, very underdeveloped or very poorly run authentic journal, which may have many of the same errors. The difference between a poorly run journal and a Predator journal is particularly well exemplified by one Predator publisher. Unfortunately, some Predator publishers have journals listed on services like PubMed. Normally this is a means of filtering the vast majority of Predators out. For this failure, and for reasons like it, websites like Beale's list of Predator publishers existed until relatively recently. This was in an effort to curb this practice and the problems it causes. So much so that institutions have created checklists and that once Beale's list of predators was removed, two more groups took up the cause and recreated the list based on archived information. Of these options, Beale's list is the more relevant, as it is an ongoing database which evaluates a publisher or journal's credibility. Although not perfect, it is a substantial step towards correcting this problem. There are alternatives in the form of black and white lists. These again are not perfect but they are based upon different preferences and styles of vetting. Compared to these predators who have made an effort, there are others who do not attempt to create this illusion of authenticity and instead target specific countries or regions with developing education and research sectors. These will often have most of the flaws given at the start of this video, and failing that, they will have obvious quality control problems such as spelling, grammar, and syntax. These groups will instead target places like China, India, and Africa. This is also another area where things like Beale's list have been criticized as they favor Western nations with a strong English background. Their ability to avoid many of those problems can be attributed to the native language. But this is also not to say that authentic, serious journals will not begin this way in other countries, but it is an indication that a substantial problem exists with faux journals that undermine the process of peer review, and that they are difficult to separate. An example of a journal going from being something that is seen as an inauthentic or predator publisher and transitioning to something legitimate is the Mediterranean Center for Social and Educational Research, which is now published by De Grutier although you can argue that social research does not use peer review. Conversely, some of the new open access journals that are seen as being authentic are arguably predatory in their behaviour towards editors and towards contributors, frontiers being especially prone towards this behaviour. This is a topic that will be covered separately. Despite all of these problems, even the researchers are starting to respond and you will find a limited list of Predator Journal sting operations below. If you want to try it yourself, there is a web page called SciGen, which randomly generates academic papers for computer science journals. In point zero zero one, we have strong statistical evidence that this drug prevents migraine headaches without daily administration. Uh, excuse me, doctor. He knows his field better than you do. It's always been my understanding that, uh, Unless you follow a daily regimen, no drug can prevent a migraine. That's why they call it a breakthrough. That's why you call it a breakthrough. No, the uh, pharmaceutical company sponsoring my clinical trials also hails it as a breakthrough. I'm sure your wife and lawyer do too. Is there anybody who doesn't stand to make a fortune from it calling it a breakthrough? Who are you? Just a lunatic who desperately needs a hobby. How exactly do these studies work? You give this drug to a bunch of people and they don't get a migraine, you go, voila, my drug works. Uh, excuse me, miss, uh, do you have cancer? Wow, mango juice prevents cancer. Uh, perhaps I should have taken my medication before this lecture. <laughs> we had a very specific control group, chronic 
migraine sufferers. I don't have time to go through all the math right now, but the incidence was dramatically... Sure. In India, two plus two equals five there, right? Do I know you? I know your math skills. They blow. Touché. You sound very familiar. Why did you publish it in an obscure journal in India? Why not publish in really, really cool hit cases of South Philly? Neuroscience New Delhi is a respected journal. Yeah. The guy running Slurp and Gulp tells me it's one of the best. Did a hooker. Anything. See, I'm thinking that publishing studies is probably the easiest way to get a pharmaceutical company to give you a reach around. And choosing a journal that no one can actually read, well, that's, that's shrewd. I know I know you. Sure you do. Dick. The name's Philip. Oh, my bad. Something to do with your face. I always think your name is Dick. House. Here. Thank you for watching this video. If it has been of interest, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.